issue will continue to arise in our courts with growing frequency. Last year's decision from the Second Circuit in law enforcement to obtain evidence in a timely and efficient manner. At the same time, he also recognizes the importance of following the rule of law and preserving privacy. In the 114th Congress, he introduced the International Communications Privacy Act, or ICPA, as a first step towards finding a legislative solution. In the 115th Congress, we are excited to be working with Congressman Jeffries to improve and build upon this proposal. We have also been working with Senator Hatch and Senator Coons. This is truly a bipartisan and bicameral effort. It is important that all parties, including privacy advocates, the DOJ, and industry stakeholders have a voice in this discussion. Our goal is to find a solution that aligns these varied interests. As the Second Circuit elaborated in its decision, Congress needs to act in order to clarify and update the law. I am hopeful that Congress that will be able to come to an agreeable solution. I look forward to hearing the insights from the panel today. Chris? Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, as my colleague Judd said, ECPA uh, comes to us in 1986, over 30 years ago. Needless to say, there's a lot that has changed in uh, telecommunications law since. Um, and, and what we have is a scenario where um, tech companies are in a place where they have to figure out whether they're going to adhere to certain privacy protections or others, right? They have to make these difficult choices. And foreign consumers are wondering whether or not tech companies are going to be able to adequately protect their privacy interests. And Congress has the, the role, the responsibility, as we did in 1986, to decide where the law goes under these circumstances. Um, recently, the Microsoft uh, case decided that um, the uh, ECPA could not be used to permit extraterritorial search warrants. And uh, our colleagues at the DOJ are now uh, seeking cert to, to get the Supreme Court's take on that decision, which is their prerogative. Um, regardless of the high court's decision, uh, it is our role here in Congress to decide what the law is and how we're going to make this work for law enforcement, for tech communities, and for privacy. Um, so with that said, you have Representative Hakeem Jeffries from New York working with Congressman Marino from Pennsylvania and our colleagues over in the Senate, Senators Hatch and Senators Coons, to find a solution that will reflect today's realities, that will balance our fundamental privacy rights and our law enforcement needs. So with that, we look forward to a lively discussion and we will take back all that is discussed here to our bosses and we hope soon that we will have a product that we can move that will make sense for everybody. All right, so thank you both for, uh, for your remarks. And so we're going to turn now to our panel of experts. I'm going to start by asking Richard Downing from the Justice Department. Richard, could you first describe, starting with the issue of, that has been of interest to the United States and the United Kingdom um, on foreign government uh, and foreign company cooperation, First, what is the issue from the perspective, from the Justice Department, from a law enforcement perspective? What is the problem that you're trying to fix? And then two, what is the current status of the Justice Department's effort to um, move this is issue forward? Sure. Um, I think uh, it's important to start with the problem, as you point out. Uh, the, the paradigm case that I think we should be thinking about is a situation where there is a very serious crime imminent or has happened in a foreign country, let's say the UK in this case, and they are trying to solve that crime. So it's a murder. Scotland Yard opens an investigation. They search houses. They question witnesses. They seize cell phones. They're able to do almost all of the investigation, except that there is a piece of evidence, a chunk of Case, which is not located in the UK, instead it's located in the United States because it's a social media account or an email account or whatever it might be. And in that situation, uh, they would normally, as uh, was mentioned earlier, have to go through the MLAT process, mutual assistance treaty process. That process is uh, usually reviled as being too slow and not up to the needs of really the speedy and important investigations that are going on. The providers are also in a jam because they see the UK needing this data, 
the UK could issue their own legal process and direct the providers to comply, and yet the, U the uh, US providers are worried that if they did that for data stored in the United States, that it would be in violation of US law to disclose it, since we have the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Uh, which has certain requirements. And yet, it's a very weird situation because why should U.S. law be controlling in this situation? It's pure happenstance, really, that the data is stored in the United States. And some have even suggested that we should just take that bar away and let uh, U.K. law control completely and not worry about the location of the data. We've taken a slightly different approach. Uh, the providers came to us uh, some time ago during the last and asked if we would work with them to come up with some sort of an arrangement where the, the blocking statute, the U.S. law that prevents the provider from complying, would be lifted in certain circumstances in certain countries. And so that's the genesis of this U.S.-U.K. arrangement, a framework. And in order to have that be effectuated, we need to have congressional action to uh, change the law. The, uh, you'll see, of course, that um, that, uh, that idea was spawned and now in this administration, uh, it has been taken up again. Last year, we released uh, a proposal, uh, and an almost identical, or perhaps identical proposal was uh, released this year, uh, this administration, because it is a practical, useful thing, which has a number of benefits. It helps our foreign partners. It's important that we support the needs of the UK in protecting its public safety. It supports the providers. It gets them out of this position of being in between two countries' laws the incentives for data localization, um, and indeed because uh, countries that would, um, would have to meet a series of robust privacy protections, it actually has an effect of raising privacy uh, ideas across the world, um, the, uh, and it has also uh, reciprocal benefits for the United States in those situations where uh, data might be stored in the UK. If I could pause you there. So what are the two parts of the proposal? Because there's an agreement that um, has to take place, right? and then there's the legislative proposal. So can you explain a little bit about sure. sort of what are the two, this can't just, this isn't just a matter of Congress passing law, there's different pieces that have to fit together. So the idea is that uh, in order for this to be worked out uh, in a sort of uh, way that does respect the, the, uh, the need for a robust set of privacy uh, safeguards and for robust civil liberties and, and, and whatnot protection, there's got to be a system for evaluating which countries around the world would be appropriate for this. And so the mechanism that we've proposed is that there would be a bilateral agreement between the United States and that foreign country, and we would work out the terms of that. But in order to have that happen, there has to be legislation that lifts the blocking uh, of the, the, that's in current law. And so what the basically the legislation says is if there is a bilateral agreement and it meets a set of really robust standards, in that situation, providers are uh, entitled to disclose information in response to foreign court orders. And those requirements are actually fairly stringent. It requires that there's no bulk collection. It requires that orders be based on articulable and credible facts and particularity so that they are specific to individuals and that there is a real basis for them. They are not allowed to target U.S. persons. This is about solving foreign crimes. It's not about targeting U.S. persons, and if they wanted to target U.S. persons, then they'd have to use the existing procedures such as the mutual legal assistance process. I, I can go on, and it's about five pages worth of requirements. It's a lot of stuff try, designed to make sure that these uh, countries that qualify for this and that we've entered into the agreements with are ones that we um, share uh, basic uh, baseline uh, civil liberties and, and legal systems that we can respect and agree with. Okay, so let me move, um, ask Professor Jennifer Daskal. Um, Professor Daskal, by the way, if you're looking for sort of background reading on this issue, Professor Daskal has done a lot of academic work on this issue, including um, long form articles as well as a number of posts on the Just Security website. Um, so Professor Daskal, can you then take what Richard has described and explain for our audience what he just described sounds perfectly reasonable, right, to the, to the initial observer. So what, what are the sticky issues? What are the sticking points? It is perfectly reasonable. Of where yeah. <laughs> there are um, areas that still need to be worked through um, in order for um, Congress to feel comfortable passing some type of legislation on this issue. 
Well, thank you, and thanks for putting on this terrific panel and for inviting me to be part of it. So I, I mean, I, I agree that this is a very reasonable proposal, um, and so I think that um, it does mediate um, between the various privacy and security and sovereignty concerns, and it is a pro an approach that ought to be endorsed. Um, there are there are some um, there are critiques of it, and I'll talk about those in a second. But but why do I say that? Um, I say that for some of the reasons that Richard already talked about, that we are talking about a situation in which a foreign government needs access for solving local serious crimes. And previously, the foreign government used to be able to get that according to their own rules from their own providers, their own telecoms, um, a, very, a variety of other sources. And because of the changing nature of the internet, and because US companies control so much of the world's data, they are increasingly finding themselves in situations where they need access to data that happens to be US held and US stored. And these countries are, I think, understandably frustrated, and that frustration is leading to a number of different incentives that I think really need to be addressed. So it's leading to, and Richard's mentioned some of this already, but um, it incentivizes companies to mandate data localization. If the data is local, they don't need to deal with the US, and they get it according to their own rules, however privacy protective or not, as the case may be. Um, it's also incentivizing foreign governments to increasingly um, seek um, access to data extraterritorially without regard to the US laws. And so it's putting companies in the middle. They basically have to decide, I can comply with one law and violate the other. I can comply with this law and violate this one. And it's not just kind of a hypothetical concern. There's been um, executives who have been, um, who have been arrested and detained because of failure to comply with foreign demands for data in, when US law prohibits them from doing so. And when foreign governments get frustrated, they seek out other surreptitious means of accessing data. And I think we see here a link between the debate that we're talking about right now and debates with respect to encryption and other means of, of finding ways around some of these problems. So that's one of the reasons why I think this is so important and why I think the legislation offers a pretty um, an, a very reasonable um, response to this because what it does is it does not require any U.S. company to provide data to a foreign government. It simply lifts the bar in those situations where the U.S. and a foreign government have entered into agreement and it sets a number of really critical limitations on what those agreements must look like. The governments, the foreign partners have to meet, have to be certified by the executive branch as satisfying basic rule of law standards. And then each request, in, a, in addition, has to meet a number of criteria that Richard already talked about. Most importantly, these foreign governments cannot get access to the data of a US citizen or a legal permanent resident um, or any other person physically located in the United States. They, can also al they also cannot get the data with the intent of then sharing the information with the United States. And if they access the data of US persons or legal permanent residents, they're required to put in certain protections in place. Um, but in addition, the specific requests have to be particularized, they have to be targeted, um, there's limits on duration, there's a requirement of judicial review. Um, I think where the, where the critiques, the most robust critiques come in are with the specifics of what's required. So there are um, suggestions that um, some, of the, some of the language says judicial review or oversight, not entirely clear what oversight means, so get rid of the or oversight, require actually judicial review. Um, there's other questions about the predicate factual standard, as Richard said, it's articulable and credible facts. Um, there's some who think it should be higher than that. Um, I personally think one thing that should be included in any final bill would be some explicit mechanism that explicitly kind of protects the company. So if they have any questions about whether or not the request meets those standards, it would protect them, allow them to kick it up to the Department of Justice and basically kick in the, the other mutual legal assistance treaty process. So there's, there's clearly minor modifications that I think that could be made to this piece of legislation, but as a whole, um, I, I agree with the basic premise that it's quite a reasonable approach okay, and so, needed. So thanks, Jen. So I'm gonna turn to Nima Singh Giuliani from the ACLU now. Um, Nima, I'm gonna ask you to weigh in on the privacy and civil liberties um, concerns that may exist with this proposal. Why should we be concerned about creating a legislative framework for a foreign government to request communications data from a US company? Sure, and 
first, thank you for having me at this panel. I'm, I'm really glad that we're discussing this issue. Um, I want to say at the <coughs> outset, I think that the ACLU and privacy, largely many um, privacy and human rights groups disagree with the proposal. Um, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and the ACLU have come out in opposition of the proposal. Um, I can't think off the top of my head based privacy group that has done a full-throated endorsement of the DOJ proposal as written. And I think the, the reasons are, um, you know, for, for a couple of major reasons. The first is, you know, we hear, you know, when I, um, Richard said this and Jen said this, that this isn't about U.S. persons. This is about targeting people overseas. Um, and I think that that is a bit of a fig leaf, right? So if I'm an individual in the U.S., as many of us, we communicate with people overseas. So obviously the standard that is gonna apply to targeting of that overseas person affects collection of my data, my conversation with somebody overseas. And so I think this idea that, you know, simply because a target cannot be someone in the US that US privacy interests aren't implicated um, is simply false. So let's just have a, a concrete example. In today's world, let's say the UK government um, wanted to collect a conversation I had had with somebody in the UK. And they were investigating that citizen of the UK for a crime um, that had occurred. Under today's system, they would have to comply with essentially the MLAT process, which would um, require them, you know, as has been explained previously, to generally comply with a warrant standard, right? So my data, my conversation with someone in the UK is protected under US constitutional standards. Now, if that standard is dropped, and if the, uh, the requirements are lessened and weakened, that affects my privacy. So we now are essentially creating a system where, you know, incidentally, as I think sometimes the government refers to it, you can collect the information about people in the U.S., citizens and um, green card holders, um, under a standard that is lower um, than a warrant standard, and potentially lower than a warrant standard, um, and under standards that are, are lower than um, would apply to the U.S. government itself if it were doing that collection. So that, I think, is a significant concern. It's also a significant concern because the proposal as drafted doesn't prohibit um, foreign governments from voluntarily sharing information with the U.S. government in certain cases, um, information that then can make its way into court and be used um, against somebody. So that, I think, is um, a major concern. The second concern has to do with allows. Um, the proposal doesn't just affect um, email stored communications like email, text messages, etc. It also involves real-time um, interception, wiretaps essentially. Um, in the U.S. under Federal Wiretap Act, Congress, um, you know, obviously reflecting um, the, the perception of the public, put in place very stringent requirements for what applies to when the government can do a wiretap. So for example, in the U.S., you can only do a wiretap for certain types of crimes. There are very robust um, procedures involving the handling of data. You know, when you see on TV when, you know, the officer wiretapping someone shuts the phone off when an irrelevant conversation happens, that is part of kind of the wiretapping infrastructure. Um, there are notice procedures. Um, you generally use wiretapping as a last resort when you've exhausted other means of, of obtaining that kind of information. All of those protections are not required for foreign governments who want to now wiretap using the apparatus created by the DOJ proposal. So essentially what you're saying is that, you know, a foreign government, um, like the UK or other countries who may enter into these bilateral arrangements, may not necessarily have to comply with the stringent requirements of the Wiretap Act that the US government would have to comply with were it to do a wiretap on someone in the US. Um, and so what you're talking about is generally, it potentially a lowering of standards as it applies to um, individuals overseas including the conversations they may be having with people in the U.S. Okay, great. So that, that's an excellent outline of the concerns. We're going to come back to this question of stored data versus wiretapping. Before we do that, um, I want to turn to Stephanie Martz with Reform Government Surveillance um, so that Stephanie can um, explain to us here what, is the, uh, what are the equities, what is the interest from the U.S.-based technology sector um, in these issues of uh, creating a framework for compliance with four. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thanks, Carrie, and thanks um, to the Internet Caucus uh, for hosting this event. I think um, this is a 
I actually think that there's a lot of agreement on this panel about what the principles are that we need to be protecting when we're talking about the very difficult issue of um, when foreign governments can get data about people uh, that are, uh, can get data that lives outside its borders, often about people who are not their own citizens. It, it implicates a very complicated matrix of laws that don't always talk to each other very well. And I think, you know, the main disagreement is how to accomplish that while maximizing the ability of legitimate law enforcement need, need to get material that's related to terrorism and to help safe, while also maximizing on the curve um, the privacy protections of all of the people who use the internet on So reform government surveillance is a group of companies um, that are uh, all the companies who, you know, make this, make the operating systems for this, have all the apps that you use on this, that basically enable us to communicate with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, RGS formed um, shortly after the Snowden disclosure uh, to support the passage of the USA Freedom Act, and even more specifically, um, to provide a forum for these companies to have detailed conversations about what exactly um, those reforms should look like and to make sure um, that everybody was really pulling on the same oar to get the important reforms to Section 215 done um, that were accomplished ultimately in the USA Freedom Act. Um, going forward, the companies have similarly been uh, concerned about other issues that implicate government access to data around the world uh, and the flip side, it, of course, the privacy rights of the consumers that use these internet platforms all over the world. So we have been very involved in discussions about encryption. We've been very involved uh, about discussions regarding um, the European safe harbor and now privacy shield regime that's in existence. Um, we have uh, uh, been involved in all kinds of issues that have arisen in the Congress in the last few years um, that you know, we would view as attempts to sometimes water down privacy protections for individuals vis-a-vis -vis governments. Um, uh, we've been involved in uh, suggesting reforms to Section 702 this year. And I think uh, w the most important priority for the RGS companies this year is to find a solution to these cross-border issues. Um, we uh, are uh, very much in favor of the language that the Department of Justice proposed with regard to um, removing the blocking that's in ECPA to allow DOJ to enter into bilateral agreements with other countries on you know, a very limited basis. I want to emphasize again, there really are, uh, Richard was not exaggerating, like five pages of requirements in the bill language that they set over, uh, including limiting um, those uh, reciprocal arrangements to serious crimes or terrorism. Um, and I think, as Professor Daskal said, there are all kinds of ways that we could probably improve definitions in that language, that we could improve processes in that language um, to make sure that what we are really doing internationally is lifting up privacy protections for people all over the world. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is that uh, the material that all these internet companies have is actually not theirs. It, it's the communications of consumers all over the world. And so when we're looking at solutions to figure out what governments can get this information and under what circumstances and what laws should govern their ability to get that information, what we have to focus on is, is really not so much is it strictly speaking and is the, is the inquiry over when we know that it's a US company because this data doesn't belong to Microsoft or Google. This data belongs to the people who are having expectations. And what are those people's expectations of privacy? What laws do they think are gonna govern uh, when, uh, when a foreign government decides that they want certain kinds of information? Um, and you know, it's it's the tech companies that really sit kind of at the crux of that, whether they whether they want to or not. You know, they're they're the ones who you know have a data center here and a customer over here and a government over here asking for that data, and they are often on the horns of a dilemma trying to figure out which law applies, when they should comply, um, what the due process really is that kind of backs up the government request that they've received, and with the MLAT process as overwhelmed and broken as it is. Um, 
companies are looking for another rights protective way to put on top of that MLAT process. Again, you know, we're not talking about replacing MLAT completely because these proposals would really only apply to certain kinds of crimes in certain kinds of circumstances, and they would only be available to governments that are truly rights protective, both, you know, substantive and procedurally. Um, we, so th this seems like a good solution for situations where governments have a legitimate need to get important information quickly. Great. Okay. So thank you. So I'd like to, that's very helpful in terms of uh, giving the, the perspective of why this issue is so important to the technology sector. I want to come back, and, and I invite all the panels to sort of weigh in at this point. I want to come back to an issue that Nima Singh Giuliani raised, which is the issue of uh, electronic surveillance and the real time, uh, the ability of foreign governments to request from U.S. companies real-time surveillance results. So I'm going to turn back to our Department of Justice representative, Richard Downing, and ask um, two, two things, really, that came from both Stephanie and Nima's remarks. One, um, is this proposal geared towards law enforcement challenges? Or Stephanie had mentioned terrorism as well. Is this a national security problem? Or sort of what's the balance between the two? So that's um, sort of question one. And then question two, does this DOJ, can you confirm that this DOJ proposal, um, administration proposal, um, would cover real-time surveillance, the ability of a foreign government to request the cooperation of a U.S. company in real-time surveillance? Is that, is that correct? And if it is correct, um, why is that part of the proposal? Sure. So uh, the way that the um, US-UK framework proposal is the, uh, that it covers uh, serious crimes, including terrorism. So uh, depends how you want to put that in the national security bucket or not. Um, it's certainly uh, terrorism is often in our country regarded as a uh, national security matter. This is not, however, about spies on e spying on other countries or any of the sort of classic espionage side of the national security. This is about uh, serious crimes, including terrorism, and of course, uh, threats and, and uh, bombings and whatnot have fall into uh, the category of criminal activity. The uh, second thing is absolutely yes, this proposal would cover uh, wiretapping and the Wiretap Act. Um, I guess I um, have a slight disagreement uh, with my fellow panelists here about why that is important or how significant that is. I think we do have to remember, though, that the basic uh, paradigm that we should be thinking about is a crime that's occurring in the UK and that the UK is trying to solve. You could imagine an uh, organized crime figure in the UK, and they need to wiretap that uh, individual to see uh, what their plan is and whether they're going to commit a murder shortly, something like that. Um, it is, of course, purely fortuitous that the interception point for that communication has to be in the United States. And here, it's hard to see why the US would have much interest in whether that law would apply. And indeed, before the current model of, of the way that these uh, communications are routed, that interception would be done under UK law in the UK and would be solved if it, if it was going to be by the UK. Um, in that situation, I would say that's the default. If a UK person, if a US person were to call in and in a, you know, get caught up in the wiretap on that thing, that UK, US person would have zero rights at all. It's whatever the US, UK law was going to apply. In fact, in this situation, they would have a lot of rights. First of all, the UK can't be targeting them. Secondly, uh, there are a lot of protections that are quite similar to US law that UK would have to comply with, like the credible facts and particular question of alternatives. It's got to be allowed these other rules that we have in our law. And in that end, they have to minimize any U.S. Uh, uh, persons that get involved in that conversation, so they can't use that evidence. And we would then have an opportunity to audit what they're doing. In fact, each country audits the other to make sure that they're complying with laws. Bottom line, though, is like the U.S., the U.K. views wiretapping as a critical part of protecting public safety. And if they don't have the opportunity to have this uh, type of arrangement where they can get access to it, it does not then solve the underlying problem that was announced at the beginning, which is that they're going to insist on decryption capabilities or data localization or something else to solve their problem. Rightfully so. They are facing serious terrorism and criminal threats in their country. To do that, this, I think, is a fair and balanced approach to how to deal with that to avoid 
uh, unnecessarily impinging on any U.S. person's rights, but at the same time giving the U.K. legitimate needs, uh, meeting the legitimate needs of the U.K. Does anyone want to respond? That was so effective really that no one has an answer. <laughs> The Wiretap Act provides, sorry, is it not on? <laughs> sorry. Um, the Wiretap Act, you know, requires notice. Um, it also considers the implications of third parties, right? So not just the target of the wiretap, but the third parties they're communicating with, um, allowing dis uh, discretion for judges also to order notice um, and information to those third parties. Um, and we're creating a framework that, you know, fundamentally doesn't have those same set of robust requirements as it pertains to wiretaps that are now going to be permitted by foreign governments, and in a way that could have very real implications for people in the U.S. who communicate with people overseas, um, and information that can be collected by a foreign government and ultimately make its way to the U.S., make its way into a criminal proceeding, even though it has not complied with the requirements of the Wiretap Act or potentially even um, the Fourth Amendment. And so I, I think I keep, you know, we keep sort of saying, well, there's a robust set of requirements that apply to countries who enter into these agreements. Um, and the reality is, I think, from our perspective, those, requ those requirements don't seem very robust at all. So, so let me follow up on that um, to our other panelists. Right so far, the proposal has been described primarily in terms of the U.S.-U.K. relationship. The first agreement um, that the Department of Justice has done is they obviously they're an ally, they're a close um, partner in cooperation and law enforcement and national security matters. But the, le the legislative change that's being requested, correct me if I'm wrong, is not country specific. Right, right. So, so what happens for the rest of the world? Maybe there's a few other countries, um, uh, either in, in North America or in Europe, who um, perhaps uh, have more similar to the United States, if not sort of not exactly, they don't have the same constitution, they don't have the same Fourth Amendment, but might have more similar judicial requirements. What happens when other countries knocking on the door to, to have this same type of, and wanting this same type of arrangement with U.S. companies? Sure. So, so it's a great question. It's an important question about really scalability. Um, before I get there, I just want to step back for one second and just think about this problem a little bit like from a housing court level, which is I mean, what, what we're seeing is all of us, because of the, the way that the internet is structured and because of the, really the dominance of U.S. companies, which I think um, is, is something that as a nation we have an interest in continuing to promote to some extent, um, to a significant extent, um, because of those two things, there is this real disconnect between territorial governments and things that used to be subject to their jurisdiction and this kind of un, this data that moves around and that is not um, physically located within territories. And so the, there's really, I think, fundamental questions about who gets to set the rules. And do U.S. rules, should U.S. rules, the specifics of U.S. rules apply simply because the data happens to be located here? Um, it's the same exact converse problem that, that we talked about earlier with respect to the Microsoft Ireland case. Should Ireland Irish rules apply simply because the data happens to be in Ireland if Ireland does not have any other interest or, 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 say, or any other equity in the case. And so I think um, like stepping back, it's worth thinking, asking some of those bigger questions. And I think as, as the country that is the home of so much of the world's data and to some extent gets to, at least for now, set some of the rules, there's a real opportunity here to demand baseline standards, but to try to harmonize approaches across borders and to facilitate legitimate access in legitimate cases so that we don't end up with kind of increased balkanization where the U.S. won't have a lot to say about what the rules that are that apply and you might see a reduction of privacy rights over there. Um, I, to, your, to your second question, or to your real question, I think that um, the idea, if this legislation were passed, hopefully it is passed, there is a U.S.-U.K. draft agreement that I would expect would be signed pretty, would be implemented pretty quickly. And I think the hope is, is that um, there would be other countries that would meet the standards and perhaps um, adapt 
changes in their own practices in order to be able to meet these standards. Um, and I think over time, ideally, you would be able to expand that out farther. There are some interesting um, proposals that some people have started to talk about. Um, in particular, Peter Swire has been writing about this a little bit, the idea that maybe some countries could have specialized points of contact. So even if the entire country couldn't be certified as meeting all of the requirements that are in the legislation, you could have units within the country that would be explicitly required to ensure that the requests met those standards. So even if you didn't trust um, all of India, maybe you could trust um, a unit within India to review particular requests to make the request to U.S. companies. So if I can turn um, to Stephanie Martz um, from the industry perspective, how are the companies who potentially will be on the receiving end of these requests from other governments, um, how are they looking at the issue of when we, if this legislation were to pass and the agreement with the UK um, were to serve as a model potentially for other arrangements with other companies, other governments, excuse me, um, how then would industry view the potential requests downstream for agreements with other countries? So um, what happens from the industry perspective when, uh, then they might be facing requests from uh, India or China or Brazil or other other types of countries that um, have different legal and judicial right. systems. Well, so I don't foresee that several of the countries you just listed there would meet these standards to be able to enter into an agreement with the Department of Justice. You know, I don't, I don't think, I don't think China is going to be high on the Department of Justice's <laughs> list um, to be entering into an agreement to let the Chinese government go directly to a U.S. technology company uh, with a with a uh, law enforcement request. Uh, I think we would be upset if we were presented <laughs> with such an agreement. Um, there are, I think there are other companies that, that there are other countries that could meet the standards. And the exciting thing about this uh, proposal is that there are other countries that that cannot quite meet the standards, but might raise their game so that they can, because it's it's important for them to be able to get information from U.S. companies, uh, which are frankly the you know the companies that uh, that have the bulk of the information that travels the internet. Um, and so that, that's something that's really, really important to the companies is to make sure that we're creating a regime that not only makes it possible for um, legitimate law enforcement asks to be met uh, quickly uh, and efficiently, but to make sure that they're met in a really rights protective manner and as a collateral consequence to um, raise the bar on privacy protections all over the world. I know, uh, you know, we're going to disagree probably on, on, on exactly whether this, this particular proposal accomplishes that. You know, I think if you were to go point by point through the proposal, um, I, I think that it is, um, that it, that it sets, that it sets the bar higher than it is right now. It will be beneficial to consumers all over the world. It will um, help to discourage countries that are close to meeting the standards from enacting blocking laws and enacting data localization laws. Um, it will give clarity to people all over the world about how their data is going to be handled. Um, and, uh, you know, we do, yes, we do have very, very stringent due process requirements here in this country. Um, uh, there are plenty of other countries that have uh, that that don't view the, the the procedural part of due process exactly as we do, um, but they nonetheless have a fair amount of oversight and independence in their in their um, uh, in the way that they review and handle law enforcement requests. And I think it's legitimate to consider those. Um, while at the same time, we're wanting other countries to honor our law enforcement <laughs> requests, you know. Um, we're, just, we're just trying to, again, maximize law enforcement and privacy on, you know, both sides of the table here. So it sounds like um, part of the confidence that's trying to be instilled in this legislative proposal and potential agreement, um, at least to start between the U.S. and the U.K., um, does rely on either judicial oversight in the foreign country or some type of institutional oversight that would take place um, in the foreign country to ensure that the request that's being made um, conforms with the principles of 
what would we would call the Fourth Amendment and, and privacy principles um, in order to, uh, to know that there's a process that goes involved. Richard Downey, can you talk a little bit about sort of how would that play out? What would that judicial and institutional oversight look like to the extent that we can envision it a little bit to perhaps provide some comfort to those who might be concerned from the privacy and civil liberties perspective? So I think you um, hit it on the head. The, the first uh, uh, layer of protection would be based on the foreign law itself. So the foreign country is investigating a crime involving its citizens uh, and it's getting legal process and of course not targeting United States persons. Um, in that situation, the legal procedures and protections that are inherent in that set of rules would be the first sort of line of privacy defense, if you like. In order to make sure that the agreement, though, is being lived up to, there's additional layer of uh, oversight um, that is done on a bilateral basis under the agreement. Um, I mentioned it briefly before, but there are provisions where uh, the United States would have the right to make sure that the foreign government is not intentionally targeting U.S. persons, for example, and that they are indeed minimizing those communications and that they have the protocols in place and, in fact, the practice is that that is being done correctly. And indeed, um, there is a provision that the uh, whole agreement has to be re upped every five years. It's a sunset provision to make sure that there is going to be a robust oversight. There's also a provision that if a provider receives a piece of legal process from a foreign government, it could raise it with the, uh, with the United States. There's a, a provision in there that says that the United States may block any particular order if it finds that it is not in keeping with the agreement. So if it came to our attention by the provider or otherwise that there was a particular order that was a problem, that could then be blocked. The other thing I want to emphasize is the congressional role here is quite strong, both on the front end of this process by setting those rules, and then at the back end of the process, that is that there is in our provision a provision, a, a, a notice that would be provided to Congress before any agreement goes into effect, and if Congress wanted to act at that point to block it or to do something different, it could do that. So this is the idea that we've been trying to work in close partnership all the way along. Uh, I think doing the base here is trying to solve problems and doing it in a way that meets the needs of the larger circle of um, equities holders. Perspective of some of the other panels, those, how do those uh, safeguards sound from a privacy or civil liberties perspective? The first is um, the idea of individualized review. Um, under the current process, if a request for lab process, whether a compliance standards um, assess a sort of um, individualized review does framework. It only exists vis-a-vis -vis the companies. Um, and I question whether, number one, um, companies have the ability and the resources to essentially do a robust individualized review. Some of the larger companies may, small and mid-sized may not. And two, they don't necessarily have the incentives to do the same robust review. Um, they have, they're, they're not on the hook monetarily or, or really otherwise other, other than their reputation um, for doing that kind of review. Um, and so the idea that you're replacing an individualized review with countrywide designations in and of itself I think is a flaw. Um, the second thing, you, we talked about the congressional role. Respectfully, I don't think a 60-day notification um, is as robust as it could be. Um, this is essentially a designation that the branch can make. Um, and, you know, simply by inaction um, from Congress, um, certain agreements can go into place. I think that that's a problem from an oversight perspective. Um, and the congressional role needs to be um, more robust. And third, even a lot of the standards articulated in the legislation only say that there are factors that need to be by the executive branch. Um, and in my, in my mind, that leaves a lot of wiggle room um, for the U.S. to enter into agreements, particularly with countries that may have inconsistent or spotty human rights records. I mean, think, um, for example, India or Brazil, where um, in certain cases, I think, you know, some of those laws would largely align in, um, with the, the U.S.'s, but in other cases, I think we would have serious concerns. Um, you know, and we've talked about taking a step back. I think we should take a step back and think about the human rights activists in India who uses the internet. And for years, they have used the internet, used US providers with an expectation that 
their communications would be subject to a certain level of privacy and certain standards, um, not just out of you know, the idea that privacy was important, but because their life was on the line. And so if we're thinking about putting in place a framework that potentially leaves room for a slightly lower standard to apply, that is something I think that we should, we seriously have to examine from a human rights perspective and, and thinking about the effect that that could have on people all over the world. So we're gonna open it up in a few minutes to questions. Um, before we do that, I want to ask Professor Daskal if you could, most of this conversation has focused on the issue of um, this US-UK agreement and when a foreign government wants to access data from a US company. Um, we've also mentioned a couple times the Microsoft Ireland case. And take a minute, and so uh, as you guys are thinking of questions, Professor Desco, could you take a minute and just distinguish the issue at play in the legislative proposal and how that's different from the issue in what's known as the Microsoft Ireland case, which the Department of Justice recently um, said it's appealing to the U.S. Supreme Court? Sure. Uh, the two-second summary, although I assume most, if not everyone in this room, knows the case. It was a case that was decided a year ago by the Second Circuit. And the issue in the case was the U.S. government served a warrant on Microsoft. Microsoft refused to comply on the grounds that the data that was sought by the U.S. government was located on a server in Ireland. Microsoft's position was that the U.S. warrant authority only has territorial reach. It could not reach data that was outside the United States. The government's position was actually Microsoft Ireland can access this data from Washington. It does all the time in the course of its normal business. There's nothing extraterritorial about this. This is a territorial exercise of the warrant authority because it's being served on a U.S. company that can do everything the U.S. government's wanting it to do from within the United States. Um, the Second Circuit, the two lower court judges sided with the government. Circuit reversed. It sided with Microsoft, and the end result is that at least according to the Second Circuit, the U.S. Warrant Authority only reaches data that's physically located within the United States. Um, this um, has been described um, by some and in the press as kind of a privacy victory. Um, I want to disagree with that for a moment for some of the reasons we've all been talking about, the robustness of the U.S. Warrant Authority and the, and the requirements of probable cause. In this case, the U.S. government accessed the data or tried to access the data via a warrant based on probable cause, which, um, as we've just discussed, is a, is a high standard, um, potentially higher than a lot of the standards in place in other countries around the world. And the net consequence of, of the opinion is that if the U.S. wants to get data located by the United States, it needs to go to that foreign country and ask that foreign country to access it according to its own rules which may be less privacy protective than the warrant. Um, the opinion is also having pretty big security consequences. Um, so Microsoft organizes itself in a more location-driven approach. It was able to say, yes, this data is in Ireland. Other companies, not as much. So Google's moving its data around all the time. Um, initially, it was not even able to say whether the data that the US government wanted was inside or outside the United States. It's fixed that problem, it now says but it doesn't necessarily provide information about where outside the United States. Um, in some cases, um, there may be no government for a combination of reasons that has access over data in a legitimate prosecution when there's been a warrant based on probable cause and it's a serious crime. There's been at least five magistrate judges that have ruled the other way, that have ruled in favor of the government in other circuits, not the Second Circuit, obviously. Um, and. Um, this is, um, as, as Carrie just said, this case may be heard by the Supreme Court. Um, I will just say one more thing and then I'll, before I'm done, which is that I think that would be unfortunate. Um, I think that um, this case is more complicated um, it, than can be resolved in a simple Microsoft's right or the government's right type um, situation, which is what the court would ultimately have to do. Um, and that ideally we would see the legislation we have already talked about coupled with a fix to this problem of Microsoft Ireland that would basically set the default that the U.S. government pursuant to a warrant based on probable cause and in the investigation of a legi legitimate crime can access data without regard to the location, but with some caveats that 
are meant to take into account the interests of foreign governments in protecting their own citizens and their own residents' data, not based on where the data is, but based on the equities of foreign governments with respect to their own citizens and own residents. And there's a couple of different ways you could do that. You could require um, courts do what's known as a comedy analysis, taking into account some of these prevailing factors when data of a non-US citizen located outside the United States. Um, there's a couple of other approaches that have been discussed as well and get into if people want to talk about. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I wanna turn to audience questions. If you have a question, I'm gonna ask that you stand, sort of wave to me, and then stand and identify yourself, and then we have a microphone that needs to make its way to you so that we make sure that your question is heard. While somebody is thinking of a question, I'm gonna pose um, a, a quick question to our panel. But so if you, if you signal me, then I'll know that I've got a question. I know someone in question. Um, in the meantime, a couple times panel, data localization. Can you, can, can one of our panelists take a stab and, and start off? What's bad about data, local, first of all, what is it, data localization, and why is it bad both from either a government perspective or perhaps from the industry perspective? Why should we be talking to Congress about legislative fix um, where one potential outcome is that we avoid um, global infrastructure moving towards data localization? Well, so data localization, as it sounds, is when a government passes a law that uh, be stored um, in a certain within that country's border. Um, it can require that the data stay there and not move from the servers uh, in that country, or it can require that at the very least a copy of the data uh, remain within that country. And um, the, the problem with that is that, number one, that essentially uh, the way a lot of companies do business on the internet. It makes it very, very difficult for cloud providers um, to do business consistent with their business model and, uh, and, and do business in a way that's completely consistent with their, the way their clients use their data, especially in an enterprise setting. You know, we're, um, uh, there, it, you know there, there are consumers, there are like business enterprises, there are all kinds of different ways that people are doing business. Uh, internationally on the internet, and that, that would potentially really break that model and dictate to companies in a very uh, unhelpful way um, how they manage and store their data. Um, number two, what that means is that th then there's this whole trove of data available in countries like Russia for the Russian government to kind of get their paws in at will whenever they want, um, and no one is really in favor of that, so. Have a comment, Mary? Yeah, I was just going to add, I mean, I think that we've heard um, a lot of talk about how these proposals will um, stop data localization. I, I want to sort of provide another perspective. I think, I'm not, not to say that this issue. To be clear, I, I don't think I'm saying that it would stop data localization. We're saying it would help disincentivize data localization. Or disincentivize, I mean, to, to be more accurate. Um, I think we have to realistically, one, the proposal on um, doesn't necessarily prohibit data localization, and that's something to consider. Um, the second is that, you know, I do think the issue of data localization is more complex. I mean, we've seen, for example, concerns over U.S. surveillance practices um, lead some countries to talk about data localization or certain lead some foreign, um, foreign companies to use that as a selling point. Um, so I just raise it to say I, I think the, the questions surrounding data localization, while I agree with the concerns that Stephanie outlined, are more complex, and we shouldn't assume um, that this in and of itself will, will stop that from happening, that, that more needs to happen. Okay, so I know that the Congressional Internet Caucus tries to keep its events on time. I'm gonna give one last chance if somebody's got a question. Okay, we've got one question over here. If you could please identify yourself and
Okay, thank you for the question. So I'm gonna ask Richard Downing to, to speak briefly to how this proposal might deal with um, sort of the incidental collection of individuals who are not targets or subjects of investigation. Sure, so I, I think the, uh, the scenario that we should be thinking about is something like the UK uh, needs to get a UK wiretap order to solve a UK crime and it turns out that they have someone in the US who's contacting them, if I understand your, your proposal correctly. Um, I, I don't know that there's a single silver bullet way of answering this. I think it would be one of those uh, things that has to be worked out in the details. It'd have to be a protocol to make sure that they weren't intentionally doing it. And as um, uh, investigators are looking through materials that have been intercepted, they would be alert to the idea that there might be a U.S. person, and if that were discovered, then that would have to be minimized. That is, put aside, sealed, not used, um, uh, except under specialized circumstances. So, that's right, minimized later, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much. So, I, I know that we are, uh, I think we have reached our limit at our time. Thank you all very much for joining us today, and please join me in thanking our panel.